Uh, we're in uh, week two of our series on stand, and we're looking at the book of Daniel. Um, if you, I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of material today, and we're not going to read it all. So if you, you really want to get this, you might pick up a Bible or open up your phone or whatever you use. Um, and, and we're going to be starting there in Daniel 2, and then we're going to go through most of Daniel, the third chapter. And um, this might be a, a timely message for some of us. Uh, if you are being feel like you're being tested right now, if life isn't going too hot right now, then this, this might be something that, that, that's really for you because, you know, it's always said that either we're just getting out of being tested or we're in the midst of being tested or we're getting ready to be tested. And nobody is immune from this in life. Everybody goes through times that are rough. And that's what I mean when I, when I say tested. So... Um, Maybe this is for you. Um, I used to read um, the, the passage when John the Baptist would say, would talk about Jesus, and he said, one who is coming after me is greater than I am, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. And I, I used to hear that and think, okay, I get the Holy Spirit stuff, you know, but why would Jesus baptize me with fire? And I wish that they wouldn't have said that. That that's just not a real good promotion for Jesus. You know, he's going to baptize you with fire, and nobody wants to be have fire as a baptism. And I wish that they would have left that out. And what did he mean? And and you know, but but then we find that God does just like with Jesus sometimes by the Holy Spirit lead us out into the wilderness to be tested. That that things go bad. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's other people. Sometimes who knows what we get laid off, or you know the relationship ends, or or whatever. And it's, it's like you know I didn't plan this. I didn't ask for this. I didn't see this one coming. But just all of a sudden, life gets really rough for us. And you know what we want to say at the offset is that this is natural. This happens to all of us, and oftentimes it is the Holy Spirit that's doing this. I want to just review before we go on here. Uh, last week we saw that the that uh, the southern kingdom Judah was taken away into exile by the Babylonians. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar took the best of Jerusalem away. He took the the royal family. He took the the best looking, the smartest of the young men and the young women, and took them away. And then last week in chapter one we had the instance where uh, three young men and Daniel uh, refused to eat the king's or asked really, to eat, not to eat the king's menu because uh, it wasn't what we would call kosher. It wasn't their dietary. It didn't fulfill the, the Jewish dietary laws. And so we see this great victory of, of God over the God of the Babylonians uh, as the, the four men were given an exclusion and they just ate vegetables and, and drank water instead of, of drinking the king's wine and the king's food. And they were ten times better looking and ten times smarter and ten times more gifted. And then at the end of that, it said that Daniel was given special ability to interpret visions and dreams. And I, I told you, I said, well, that's, we're going to see that next week. And that's, that's just what happens. And chapter 2 opens up, and we're skipping over most of this. Let me just fill in. There's one important part here. In chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And it's, it really troubles him. And what's troubling about it is he can't remember what the dream was. He wakes up and he goes, oh, man, that was terrible. You know, well, what was that last night? And, and this guy has to mean something, but I can't remember what it was. So he calls in his sorcerers and his Chaldeans and his magicians and his astrologers. And he says, tell me what the dream was so you can interpret it. And they go, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we, we can interpret it. But how are we going to know, tell you what the dream was? You know, I can't remember it. And so he says, tell me what the dream is or, you know, I'm going to tear you to pieces and you and your families and it's just this terrible thing that's going to happen to him. So they're like, ah, the king's nuts, you know, and he's asking things of us. So, so Daniel comes to the rescue. And Daniel says, no problem, I can tell you what the, what the dream was. And so he tells the king what, what the dream was. And he says that the dream was is that you saw this this statue, and this statue had four, it was composed of four things, and the head was out of gold, and the breast was was silver, and and then the, the mid part was out of bronze, and the feet were out of iron. And these four sections each resemble a kingdom, represent a kingdom. 
And Babylon is the top, is the gold part. And then the Persians are the silver and, um, you know, each, each, each uh, different uh, kingdom has a, has a different part here. And uh, he goes on to tell him, Daniel 2, 37 to 38, says, You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. And then Daniel goes on to tell him that there's going to be another kingdom that will have no end. And um, the, there's, there's going to be another kingdom first. I'm sorry, messed that up. There's going to be another kingdom first of the, the, the Persians that are the silver, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then there's this kingdom that will have no end. And this, this last kingdom, talking about the kingdom of God, it says will crush all these other kingdoms. And, and evidently the king uh, really liked that image of himself being the, the king of gold. But it was also maybe a little troubled that there were also other kingdoms that were coming after him, that his kingdom would end. So what is he does next shows exactly what he thinks of himself. He goes south of town about 15 miles, and he has this huge statue erected, a huge giant idol, and it's made of gold. It's covered in gold, and it says that it's 90 feet tall. So just kind of as a point of reference for us, uh, most water towers about 100 feet. So you get how big this statue is. You can see this thing that's nine feet wide, 90 feet tall, made out of gold. And, and as we can guess, that there's probably a striking resemblance to the way that this statue looks in King Nebuchadnezzar. Just so happens to look like him. You know, isn't that convenient? And he orders everyone in the empire to assemble down on the, this plain of Dura for the dedication of this huge idol. And here's the plan. I mean, he, he has the royal band out there. They've got their little band suits on. You know, I see with, you know, maybe some drum majorettes and stuff. I don't know what they did back then, but something like that. And, and all the dignitaries and, and, uh, the, the people who are in charge of the government, in charge of the cities, and they're all down there and they're all wearing their best stuff, and it's a royal dedication, and you can see this golden statue for 15 miles, and the sun hits the gold, and my gosh, you know, it just, it's unbelievable. I've never seen a statue like this. And this is what's going to happen, he says. When the band plays their note, then all of you, thousands of people, everybody from the empire that's assembled here, you're all going to bow down at the same time and worship this giant idol that the king has set up. And everybody is going to be united. It's Babylon together. For once, we're all together. Every people from all these different languages and some of us have come from different places that I've conquered, but we're all going to be together. And, and this is going to be a moment that you're going to tell your grandkids about. We were down there the day that the idol was set up and oh man, Nebuchadnezzar, he was something else. I remember that day. Oh, and, and just in case your patriotism isn't real strong, uh, I want to mention to you that there is a furnace over there. You see the furnace? And it's really, really hot. You can see that. And if you don't bow down, you're going to go in the furnace. Now, there's nothing like the threat of death to change someone's theology. Okay? What, what, you, what you believe can change real quickly when someone says, do this or die. All of a sudden, your beliefs start to change. You know? And so that's what he throws in here. I'm a little skeptical of TV shows and movies where someone is about to be tortured. You know, the, the, the bad guy is going to get the electric drill in the knee or, or they pull out the pliers and they're going to take out your fingernails if you don't tell them, you know, where this guy is or where the money is or whatever. Or they're heating up the stoker, you know, the old westerns. They always had a stoker in the fire that they were going to brand you with if you didn't. Uh, do that. And I'm always a little skeptical of how that goes because usually in that scenario, the guy has to get a knee drilled before he tells him anything, right? 
Or, or they, they pull out a couple of nails before he gives it up. Or, or yeah, this is getting gross. Or, or he takes the, you know, they, they get one place branded. And they go, okay, 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 I've had enough. Now, I don't think that's real. I mean, is there something wrong with that storyline there? Because either you're going to, I think, either you're going to go all the way through and you can drill my knees, you can kill me, I don't care, I'm going to give it up. Or when I see the drill, I say, I've changed my mind. Right? But nobody gets one knee drilled or one, one fingernail pulled out and then you go, ah, I think I've changed. I think, I think I've changed my mind. Now we see that and we've got our mind made up. And there's that day there's three teenage boys who've made up their minds. Evidently, they were behind the king when he gives the sound and the band plays the note and everyone else hits the ground and they're worshiping this giant idol but these three guys stand firm and the furnace is right there and the fire is raging. They must be deaf. They can't hear, you know, uh, because they're the only ones left standing. The rest of the world is united. The rest of the world is down on their faces in front of this great statue. And what in the world is wrong with these three guys? Well, someone saw them. Evidently, the king didn't see him. Because a few of the Chaldeans, the uppity Babylonians, said this. Daniel 3, verses 9 through 12. O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, have disrespected or disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. You say, Jews, they're not like us. These guys aren't like us. We saw them. They didn't do what you said to do. They've disregarded. They've disrespected you. And it says that King Nebuchadnezzar's face became distorted with rage. And he says, what? He says, don't they know who I am? Can't they see me? Don't they know my power? Get them over here. And this is where it really gets good. He gets the three boys over to him and he says, do you see the God that we serve? There he is, 90 feet tall. I hear that you don't worship and serve him. So I'm going to give you a do-over. He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. Let, let, let's just pretend the first time didn't happen. Okay? So here's another chance. Daniel 3.15. Nebuchadnezzar says, Now if you are ready at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Whew. What God? <laughs> he, he thinks he's everything. What God is there? Well, that's about to be answered, isn't it? He says, I've got you guys. You have to do this. There's no God that can save you from that furnace. Just So just go along. And let, let's do this one more time. Okay, guys, are you ready? When I raise my hand and then I lower it, the band's going to play. And this time, you know, I want you to fall down on the ground and worship the golden statue, the great God that I put up. And then we can have a party and we'll go home. Okay, ready? And here's their reply. Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Hmm. They say, we don't have to pray about this. We don't have to talk about this. Uh, we don't have to vote on this. We don't have to research this. We don't have to Google this. We know what we're doing. We're standing. <laughs> and it's not our problem, King. You see, we're standing with God, and that's your problem right here. 
This is not between you and us. This is between you and our God, Yahweh. Now, I, I, you know, let's be real. Who wouldn't rationalize this? Who, who wouldn't compromise this? This would be so easy to rationalize about this. You say, you know, the, the three get together in a huddle and they go, look, just bow down this once. I mean, so what if we do this? It, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a statue. It's not really a god. It's just a man-made thing. It, it, it really isn't a god. And we'll bow on the outside. On the inside, let's recite one of David's psalms while we're doing that. Let's stay true to God on the inside, and we're just going to bow down on the outside. We're going to get this thing over, just play along. In our hearts, we're not worshiping. We're being true on the inside. Plus, if we don't bow, we're dead. And who's going to tell these pagans about Jehovah if we're dead? Right? So, so we have to go along. Change our beliefs to match the pressure. But they didn't. They said, we don't need to give you an answer. It's a no-brainer, King. I think God has been giving me a message uh, for me and perhaps for somebody that's here uh, this week. I've had a very strange occurrence. Three people have said this exact same phrase to me this week, and they're three people that are not close friends. One of them was just a person I met for the first time, and within five minutes he was telling me this. Three different conversations, and they said the same thing. And to paraphrase it, they, they said, I, I do what God says to do, and I leave the rest up to him. It's a very simple statement. I just do what God says to do, and I leave the rest up to him. Don't need to worry about it. It's not my problem. Okay? Three people have told me that this week. I thought that's strange. Uh, and I, you know, I said, okay, I hear what you're saying, Lord. Stop analyzing everything so much. Just do what God says to do. Leave the rest, leave the fight up to him. And I, I suspect that since I preach every Sunday, that there's probably somebody here that this message is for too. Just do what God says to do, we, we don't need to figure everything out. We don't need to know everything. Some things are very simple. But, oh, what does God say? There's the question, isn't it? What does God really say to do? Well, the three young boys knew what God was saying to do. You see, the first commandment was, You shall have no God before me. Second commandment, You shall make no graven image. Should not worship any other God and no graven image. And they knew that they wanted to be in covenant with God if they expected God's favor upon their lives, that they were not to break that covenant by breaking those commandments. So number one, number two of the Ten Commandments. Now, modern followers, I think this is a little bit more difficult. We think it's more difficult. We think that we are more sophisticated than Jews on the plain of Dura, the 600 B.C. in Babylon. Our college profs, if you've ever been to a college religion class, our, your college prof will probably tell you the first or second week that the Bible is a literary work and we should read the Bible like we read other literary works. Revelation is completely out the window. Let us analyze it based on the culture, based on the literary form, but that's where it stops. And most of our college profs will tell us, you probably had this experience, will tell you that, you know, this is just an expression of humanity's ideas about God, is what this is. That this is not a book of God speaking to us but it's what it is, is a collection of books, which t actually it is, 66 books together. That's what Bible means, is books. A collection of books of humanity trying to work out their religion. So piece by piece, if you've had this experience, piece by piece we begin to get doubt that comes in. We go, I'm not really sure what of this I can believe, because obviously some of this according to my professor, is not really true. So what of this can I take and what has to be cast aside? And obvious compromises are made. Um, oftentimes where we end up is we take the thou shalt nots and it's replaced with 
you really ought to think about this. You really ought to think about whether, you know, you want to worship another God about it. You really ought to think about whether you ought to create that graven image. And you really should get some more information. Maybe you don't have enough data. So you need to collect some more information. And, and obedience, excuse me, I know I don't talk about obedience much, but th- I think this is timely here. Obedience is, is placed with agreement where we go, yes, God, you said that and I agree with you. And he goes, well, I'm so glad that you did. I'm so glad that you've agreed with my word. This this is the modern day mindset. The collection of data replaces the hearing of God's word to us. And they say, or we say, you know, it's not our problem. It's God's problem. And we stand. Those two in contrast to another. So let's go on. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again. Our God is, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They have said, this is between you and our God, and our God is able. He made the gold that you covered the statue with. You see, he made the sand today on which you stand. He, he made the sun that shines on this idol. He made you king. He made those <clears throat> who kneel before your idol today. He made it all for his pleasure and he made it all for his glory. And if he made it, he is able to do anything with it that he wants to do. Our God is able, he said. And my God is able. And your God is able. That's been the belief of every person who stood in the midst of the test that their God was able. I think of Abraham as Abraham's walking towards Mount Moriah and he has his only son with him who God has said to him, I want you to take your only son and sacrifice him to there on a place where I will show you. And as he's walking with his boy with the wood being carried on his son, he's going to climb up that mountain. Do you think Abraham was worried? Abraham wasn't worried at all. You see, it says that he thought that if the boy would be sacrificed that God would somehow raise him. So Abraham... His, we get this all wrong. We go, oh, poor Abraham being tested like this. No, Abraham is saying, I wonder how God's going to do this. I wonder what he's going to do today. Because you see, the last thing in his mind is that something bad is going to happen to him. Because he knows his God is able, and he knows that he's in covenant with his God. As Moses stood there in the palace before Pharaoh, the most important man in the world, you think Moses was scared? No. <laughs> Pharaoh could have had his head any time he wanted and there wouldn't have been a thing that happened. Moses said, my God is able. When Joshua was marching around Jericho and in that silly formation with the priests and the trumpets and all that stuff and that little army in front of the great city, and it was at that day, a great city of Jericho, he was saying, my God's able. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's able. When young David went out to face Goliath, with his little slingshot and his five stones. He was saying, the guy's big. God is able. The God of the Philistines is not able, but the God of the Israelites is able. When young Mary was visited by the angel and said, you're going to become pregnant with a child from God. And she goes, I don't understand. How could that be? And God says, all things are possible with God. He's saying, it's able. God is able. And she says, let it be. Here's a verse that I love. It's from the book of Ephesians. Paul says the same thing. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever Amen. God is able, he says, beyond all that we can imagine, think about. But if we never stand, we'll never know how able God is. 
we will never see it because we don't give God the chance. He's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. But if we go along, if we rationalize it, if we said, ah, I'm not so sure, we'll never let him show his power. Now, through the years, I've had so many people say, you know, you talk about the power of God, and I have friends that talk about the power of God and the presence of God, but I just don't experience it. I just don't get it. And what the church has done with that oftentimes is, oh, you need another experience. We need to get you up front, and we need to give you another experience of the power of God. And I think we're missing it there. I think, I think what we've missed is the obedience to put God in his place and say, you are able, I'm going to stand, now I will see the power of God. And most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when the person says, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, I've never experienced any of this, it's because the person has been led down that path of rationalizing, weaseling out of it, going, gosh, I don't know. Listen, there's some things that God says are so simple. Some things are so simple that we should do. There are other things that I admit are more complicated. I'm still struggling to do the things that are so simple. I'm not going to worry about the things that are complicated. I'm just going to worry about the things that are simple. So you know how this goes. He orders them to be bound. He selects some strong soldiers to throw them in. Since the furnace is so hot, the soldiers die trying to get him in the furnace. And here we finish up again. Daniel 3, 24 to 30, the major, major part of the scripture. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, oh, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was their hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire, fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Boy, he got it there, didn't he? Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb, and limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in, in, in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. End of third chapter. And so the conclusion of a story of standing... <coughs> You know, there were other Israelites there that day, men from Judah. The, these, these Daniel and the three guys weren't the only ones that were taken captive. There were others there. They didn't stand. They knelt. Only three guys are standing that day. And the account here mentions just three young boys that went through the test. They were walking around in the midst of the fire, unharmed, with another figure, it says. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, there is what we would call a Christophany or a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ. And he is the fourth man in the furnace. There's so many other places that we could go through, but just to say this is the Emmanuel effect. This is God with us. Okay, And they go into the furnace, but they don't go in there alone. God goes in the furnace with them. And not only is God able, but God loves them and nothing can separate them. Nothing can separate us from his love. No sin can separate us. No trauma, no test, no disease. Nothing can separate us 
from his love. And then it says they were thrown in, bound in the fire. They were loosed. Nothing changed about them. The fire didn't touch them at all, except the ropes on their hands were gone. I think later if, when Jesus preached his first sermon in Nazareth, and he quoted the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah 61, and Jesus said, I've come to set the captives free. Well, he's already set captives free 600 years earlier. Because these three men, not only were their, their ropes burnt off or loosed, but that is figurative of the freedom that they found because that day, you stop and think about it, those three men really died. You, you couldn't kill them anymore. You couldn't threaten them with anything. What are you going to threaten Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with? Death? Well, we, we've been through that. We went through the furnace. You know, you can't kill somebody that's already died themselves and said, I'm willing to give my life away. They died in the sense that no one could ever take their lives from them. No one could kill them. They were free from the fear of death. And they knew that their God was able and they knew that their God loved them and he set them free. And all they needed to do was to do what God had said and leave the rest to, to God. We don't even need to give you an answer, King. God is able. God loves us. God looses us. I want to close with a, a story about a man that was that, that got this whole message. It, a prominent seminary professor told this about um, the first church that he served. It was in a very rural area in a mining community. And he says that there was a miner <clears throat> who was injured in the mines as a young age, and he became crippled and invalid. And over the years, he watched uh, through the window besides his bed as the world went by because he was bedfast for the rest of his life. And his, because of lack of income, his house was in shambles. And he watched other people prosper and raise their families and have grandchildren. And he watched as his body continued to deteriorate and his house deteriorate and his family did not prosper. Then one day, the bedridden miner was quite old and a younger man came to visit him and the younger man said well I hear that you believe in God and that you claim that God loves you and said the young man he says how can you believe such a thing how can you with in your physical state and in the condition of your house and what's happened to you how can you say that God loves you well, the old man paused for a little bit and then he smiled and he said, he says, yes, it's true. He says, sometimes Satan himself comes here and he sits in that chair beside my bed like you and he sits right there by my bed and he points out my window to the man that I once worked with who is still strong and active and he asks, he says, does, does Jesus love you? And then Satan casts a jeering glance around my tattered room as he points to the fine home of my friends across the street and he says does Jesus love you look at their homes and then at last Satan points to the grandchild of a friend a man who has everything and I do not and Satan waits for the tear in my eye and then he whispers in my ear does Jesus really love you the young man says, so what do you say to Satan when he speaks to you that way? And the old miner said, he says, well, I take him in my mind. I take him by the hand and I lead him up to Calvary. And I show him the place on Jesus' head where the, the thorns rested and the holes in his hands and the hole in his side and in his feet. And then I ask Satan, does Jesus love me? tested through the fire. We only get through the fire if we believe that God is able and that we believe that God really loves us. That frees us. That looses us. Free to accept the cross. The, the picture of God's ability to die for us and his willingness and his love for us. Well, let's sit for a minute in prayer. Oh, who are three?
As deep cries out 